next up with VIPteach.org. And on the topic is on equitable access to quality education through technology. Technology is a big focus of our center here in Northern California. Moderating again, we welcome back from Washington, DC, Wen Chi Yu. Welcome. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good to see everyone again. Um, so I'm Wen Chi Yu, Asia Society's Asia 21 Fellow and VIP Kids Head of Public Policy. Uh, VIP Kid is a global education technology platform that connects tutors and students for live, immersive K-12 English learning. In 2019, VIP Kid C funded VIPTeach.org, a nonprofit organization that empowers education leaders with technology and professional learning to drive innovation and equity in education. Last fall, we launched the very first cohort of Global Online Teaching Fellowship, which attracted diverse education sector talent through a selective, unique part-time online fellowship. The fellowship aspires to build a pipeline of tech-savvy and culturally competent education professionals prepared to leverage technology to provide all students with the quality education they need to succeed. The first cohort of 25 fellows graduated just last week, and we have three with us, uh, with us today. Having completed their online teaching uh, to rural students in China, professional development and capstone projects. Now, during the COVID pandemic, the world witnessed the largest remote learning experiment in history. According to UNESCO's estimate, uh, by mid-April, 1.6 billion children were no longer being taught in a physical classroom, and only 2% of the teachers felt online learning was comparable to in-person learning. While some parts of the world reopened schools and adopted a hybrid learning model, COVID continues its rage on most parts of the world, disrupting student learning, furthering inequality. And as evidenced by a number of reports, ethnic minority communities in the United States suffered the most in learning loss during the pandemic. So what can we do? Today, we're here to offer solutions. And we're really honored to have three of our VIP Teach Fellows who represent three different projects through which they collaborated with their colleagues. Their educators and community leaders during the pandemic, each one of them through their individual project, address the learning loss in K-12 education. And I'll let them share with you their work. Uh, the first one is Susan Landera. Susan hails from New York. Uh, she and a few uh, of her cohort fellows, Kate and Tamara, uh, delivered a really innovative project to help address uh, learning loss. Susan, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Wenchi. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today. And I'm just going to share with you some information um, about our capstone project. So um, it was entitled Combating Pandemic-Induced Learning Loss. So as Wenchi stated, um, schools nationwide, worldwide shut down during the pandemic. Um, our project was designed to kind of um, close the learning gap that was happening. Um, students were thrown into a world that they um, didn't know. Parents became educators. Teachers had to revamp the way they taught um, and the way they got their students to focus. As online educators for four years plus, um, to Kate, Tamara, and I were able to go in uh, speak with teachers, parents, students, and help them feel more comfortable in the world of online learning. So I'd like to share a little bit about us first. So I am Susan Landira, again, a fellow with VIP Teach, an ESL teacher with VIP Kid and a special education teacher. Kate, who's also um, on our project, also a fellow and an ESL teacher, but also a high school and middle school English teacher. And Tamara, also a VIP kid ESL teacher and VIP teach fellow and an elementary school and preschool teacher. As we spoke to parents who were thrown into this online world of learning, um, they were very concerned 
about their students falling behind. There were these steep learning curves uh, for teachers, for students, for parents. Differentiating instruction became more and more difficult and parents didn't know where to turn. So they reached out to tutors online and were paying upwards of $70 an hour to help their students. But we thought, what happens to the students who cannot afford to pay this? What happens to the parents, the underserved community, um, the students who really needed the extra help and couldn't afford to pay that amount of money to obtain it? We reached out to specific school districts, agencies, um, and various uh, schools in our areas, we ended up working with two schools specifically in New York. So we worked with the Ark of Mid-Hudson and we worked with the school here locally to me um, and the outpouring of people who wanted our help was unbelievable. Not only did they want help with academics, but they wanted help with just the social aspect of being online. We had some parents who just wanted their second grader to come in and be able to get used to using the computer and seeing someone they didn't know in their home sitting in front of the computer. And, and we raised, rose to that challenge because we had been doing this for so long. Our goal not only was to improve grades, um, but also, as I said, to increase the comfort of the students online. So in our surveys at the end of the project, we ended up receiving numerous reports of students whose grades increased, reading grades increased, math grades increased, um, students' participation in their online classrooms increased. Um, so our project, was it a success? I feel absolutely. Was it a success in other ways? I think so too, because not only did our students receive some kind of training, learning with us online, and also their tutoring, but parents also received some training in logging in their students, using Calendly to go in and schedule their appointments with us, um, using Google Forms to give us information, um, email, of course, to give us feedback. Um, with that came additional sites and resources that we were able to bring into the classroom and use. So these are some of the um, sources, resources that we used. There were, uh, there were others as well. We did run into some students in rural areas who had some IT issues. So we turned to our flashcards and our visual aids there. Despite constant contact with parents, we did seek anonymous feedback from them and we received some glows, letting us know that yes, they enjoyed coming to class. They really were able to sit in front of the computer. They really were able to engage um, with their tutors and they, their grades improved. What were some of the grows? Well, we learned that we can only do what we can do. As you saw, there were only three of us. Um, and we had an outpouring of students who really needed this kind of service. Um, so among time slot shortages and IT issues and accommodating people with different schedules, um, we really were able to help a lot of students. Um, the schools thought the programs were so successful that they'd like them again next year, even though the students may be back physically next year, they'd still like the tutoring program online next year. Um, key takeaways we had under promise and over deliver. So one thing that principals and directors did tell us was that they would like the length of the program to be longer. We had a few months with them. Um, I feel it was a huge success because in that short time we had, we were able to see these increase in grades um, and that closing of the gap that we were hoping for. We served the lost population. The lost population that was, they were unable to pay the for the extra tutoring. They were unable to access some resources. So we definitely were able to reach out to these students. And that is my project. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Susan. I think uh, access to technology is definitely a challenge uh, nationwide and worldwide, which we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, 
uh, Jackie will address that. Loretta, share with us uh, the fantastic project you worked on. Thank you, Wenchi. So a little bit of background about me. Um, I was a former elementary school teacher and current reading specialist, as well as a full-time faculty lecturer of reading courses at Loyola University, Maryland, here at School of Education. Teaching teachers, as well as pre-service teachers, best practices of teaching reading is one of my passions. But one of my biggest passions in life is actually to help children find the love for reading books. Now, Accessing physical books can be tough during summer months for some of our nation's population. Lack of access to books and just not reading during the summer can lead to summer reading loss. This could widen the reading achievement gap between the economically advantaged and the disadvantaged families even more. This was where my capstone project, Books for Baltimore, was instrumental. It brought books to the hands of students in three schools in Baltimore City. And along with those books, a read aloud digital recording where students could access through their own devices via a QR code so that they can read along or listen to read aloud of the books that they have. The, the one thing that came out of the pandemic is that most students now have got some form of digital device in their home from school issued ones, right? If it's not their own. So 518 students were invited to come pick up books before the summer holidays, and about half of that number came. Most were able to go home with about three to four books for the summer months. So I'm going to share with you a video showing some of the students that actually got the books. And that was it. So yes, I'm in the midst of incorporating Books for Baltimore as a 501c3 so that we can continue what we started this year. Uh, although we only received 13 responses to our survey, um, hopefully the parents will come to the paper that I sent out together with each book to see that they can go take the survey so that they can participate again next year. Thank That's you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Jackie, um, Jackie has a different project. Uh, she's in the process of uh, pursuing her PhD. Um, and so her project is based on her research. Hello, uh, my name is Jackie Robinson. And yes, I am pursuing my doctorate. It's actually an EDD in organizational leadership, but I am researching strategies that support change in rural schools use of technology to teach 21st century skills. And 21st century skills are the four C's, communication, creativity, collaboration, and 
course, I'm going to forget the fourth C right now, but I will get to it in just a moment on my slides. <laughs> and so doing dissertation research is a little bit different. You have to say why you're doing the project. The lead up of why, why is this even worth researching? So um, I have found a lot of rural teachers are not using technology in the classroom because they're not taught how to. In college, they were taught to use, you know, go to Microsoft Word and, and make them write a paper and, and use PowerPoint to project your, your lesson, but it's not, they're like one-off lessons. It's not like an integration of technology in the classroom. And in our daily lives, we're using technology for this and that, Alexa, recipes, um, timers, you, you name it, we're using it all day long, but why isn't that translating into the classroom? And a huge reason is that they're not taught how to do that. They're not to do that or how to do that. Um, so this is just more background of the problem. And a lot of it is stemming from teacher training institutions, higher ed, uh, students that are in college learning how to become a teacher, um, are not seeing very good modeling of how to do this. Um, some of it is a generation thing. You know, the people who are training have been in it for umpteen years and aren't using technology that, that way either. Um, and, then not, and a lot of it also is that they were never trained to do it, so they don't know how to train others to do it. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a big domino effect really so the problem that i'm researching is a strategy for how to implement this change um, vip teach has given us some very wonderful speakers throughout the the year of our fellowship and um, i hope to be uh, interviewing them as leaders as educational leaders um, to you know get get something down on paper to get this this change started. I'll be using two different um, or two different theories. I'll be using uh, Cotter's model of change, and it's a st eight step process for change. And I figured that if we're teaching teachers how to change, then uh, they need to see something. <laughs> they are visual. So if there's a different step for each of these teachers to see what's going on. Um, you know, they will be able to follow along, hopefully, and, and buy in a little bit more. Um, the other model I'm using is for the actual changing of, you know, the mindset in, in teaching. And that's the Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge Framework um, by Mishra. Um, teachers in the blue, they know their content knowledge, right? Um, they also know their pedagogical knowledge. They have, they know how to to teach it. However, they were not ever taught the pink, the technological knowledge. Sometimes they, you know, have trouble turning on the computer. Um, sometimes they know how to do that, but then mixing it with pedagogical and mixing it with the content um, to become that that perfect middle little triangle thing is is really what's missing. So I have four themes within my project. Theme one is leadership strategies. Um, leadership strategies are how leaders implement instruction. Rural schools technology use, um, it's lacking for various reasons. Sometimes it's infrastructure and sometimes it's, it's just a lack of devices. Um, but more often than not, it's because of teacher, lack of teacher training or self-efficacy, being confident enough to teach the technology or with technology. And theme four, 21st century skills, which one did I forget? Oh, critical thinking. Critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. Um, these, are the, these are the skills that students need to be successful in their jobs after they graduate. And doing this digitally is what is going to make them have more opportunities for success. And then finally, organizational growth and development refers to the change process in organizations. So those are the four themes that I will be studying to meld together into my one big topic. 
So my problem is it is not known how academic and marketplace educational leaders describe strategies to support changing rural schools use of technology to teach the 21st century skills of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. I have four questions that will be answered. Um, they are the exact same, but with um, the four different um, C's. And I, I just want to understand the leadership strategies of how to do this, to be able to trickle down into the um, individual um, districts for, for educational leaders in rural schools to be able to do this also. So that was my project. Well, thank you so much. Actually, thank you all three of you uh, for really leading those amazing um, ideas and initiatives during the pandemic, uh, because um, what you're seeing is a learning loss is a huge problem uh, facing our community as well as the entire world. Um, so um, I would like to know actually how, how much more time we have since we started this session a little bit early. Uh, if someone can just give me a reminder so I'm, I'm sticking to it. But in the meantime, uh, for the audience, please feel free to um, actually uh, put in your questions and uh, we'll try our best to answer all of them. Uh, in the meantime, um, just to start, um, you know, all of you uh, are educators uh, yourself. And um, I think the pandemic has truly, um, I would say ushered in a new era of education and teaching. Um, we're seeing not only schools are closed, uh, parents struggling to, you know, keep their kids continue learning, uh, teachers also struggling, not only they have to take care of their kids, they have to take care of their students as well. Um, and then they have to take care of themselves. Um, and so, you know, as educators, what do you, what would be your advice and suggestions um, in terms of, you know, what we can do to support uh, schools, uh, school teachers, I'm sorry, uh, school teachers when it comes to um, learning? Because, I mean, even in our country, there's still so much debate and discussion going on in terms of, you know, reopening school, whether it's safe or not, and how do we guarantee that students um, can continue learning or not, or is it going hybrid? So many parents don't feel comfortable putting their kids. Just, there are just all kinds of issues challenging us right now. Um, tell us as an educator what your advice is. I can go. <laughs> so, so I think one issue I see is that, you know, when you have one teacher to a group of like 20 something students online and they are, I'm talking elementary here. Okay. Could be high school as well. High school might be a bigger number. When you have one to 25 or more, students will get lost. And I mean, like, it's already a big class to begin with. Online, it's even they will get lost because you're not you you, you might not see the you know you might not see the uh, uh, faces. And they're okay to like turn it off. So it's so hard to make that connection. I feel that if teachers can get support where um, they can have classes like smaller classes or maybe have a different adult in every breakout room so that they get that kind of a support, like, you know, maybe like a one to eight, one to seven, where they can actually connect with the students in an online format. It is so hard to connect to begin with, but when the numbers are so big, it's even harder. So I feel like the smaller numbers would really, really help with the connection as well as to help with learning in general. That's that's my take. I, I feel that that's what would help support teachers all over the nation and around the world. Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Just go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Wenchi. Um, my advice is to let your students know that it's okay if you make a mistake, that everyone here is learning together and it's okay if you don't know something or if your computer does something or if you don't know how to fix something. Let them know that that's okay. Um, because a lot of the students that we encountered really panicked when something went on with their computer or if they couldn't see something, they were panicking. Um, and I, you know, it's important for them to know that it's okay. It's happening to everyone around the 
the world right now. Um, it's not just your computer and you're going to be okay. Um, but the other thing is to keep it very structured. I teach special education and it's very structured environment. My students come in from different school districts and we were told at the beginning of the semester when we were going to go online that they aren't going to show up. They're not going to show up. They're not going to participate. They're not going to work. And I can tell you that I had 98% attendance for that entire first semester. Um, they came, they participated. We kept it very structured as it, just as it would have been if we were in person. Um, so I would say, keep your structure and re try and relax. It's okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> Any advice, Jackie? I, I actually have a little bit of a different take on it because I was a school counselor. So mine is coming from like the social loss, the social learning loss that happened. And if a student comes in and understands that, hey, I'm behind in math. Oh, no, I'm not good at math anymore. That can possibly take them out of a beautiful math career someday because their confidence is gone. So not focusing on the loss of what they've learned when they come to school and not saying that, oh, we're behind and somehow just saying, well, this is where we're at. This is where we're starting. And them being okay with that will go, in my opinion, further than trying to catch up and get extra tutoring and all of this other, you know, stuff that's out there, honestly, which is not wrong either. Um, but I think the social aspect of it is probably going to be in the end, the bigger issue. Kids are sponges. They'll learn as fast as you teach them, kind of. Um, I read a really interesting article where they taught, where they, they were talking about over teaching, like teaching it so it was just a little bit too hard every day, which meant that basically they, they eventually catch up, but you're not telling the kid that they need to catch up. You know, they just support them and keep it a positive environment and eventually you're caught up to the test but then then again that's a whole other thing teaching to the tests but i really think um taking care of their social emotional health um when they come back is a bigger kind of thing to think about well that's such an important point um because we may have all emphasized on just their academic performance uh rather than their social emotional needs um but teachers as well um what i have seen is you know parents literally panic um about this i've seen so many parents um who have amazing you know tools and means and they worry about their kids you know falling behind and truly it is just not the same um, but in the meantime, you do have those who are falling further behind uh, because they don't even have the access to technology. Um, they don't even have a, a school environment that, you know, or a stable family environment that provides them the access to online education. So I think that this discrepancy, uh, the disparity is growing. Um, and that's where I know all of you all also care about. That's why you're, you know, committed to teaching online um, and to the underserved communities. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about that experience, just, you know, teaching rural students in China, how that experience has been or teaching Velo program uh, through the United Way. Okay, I can go first. Wenji, I think that teaching rural education program through China is such a rewarding experience for me. Um, but also when you see your students that you've been with the entire semester who otherwise would not have access to an English speaking person or to the um, educational process of learning English, when you see them create a complete sentence, there is nothing better than that feeling. Um, they are so willing to learn and they just need the access to it. So I'm honored to give them that access. Also through through Velo, I volunteer and I, I teach with a school in Pennsylvania. So it's not, we think of the China as being so far away and these students are so vastly different, but they're not. You know, they're just students who may not have had the opportunity and really want to learn. So whether it's through Velo in the United States or through REP in China, 
that's what we're giving them, the opportunity at a better future. And, and they're really, really grasping at that. Um, anyone else wants to share experience? Well, I echo Su Susan's thoughts there. <laughs> Susan has been teaching in the rural education program a lot longer than I have. I've only done it in this past year, but it's been an, a wonderful uh, experience being able to connect with uh, students in rural China and visiting their classroom each week and, and seeing the improvement from semester to semester and seeing them so excited to want to show you know, hey, I can actually write a full sentence and read it out and, and, and them performing a song in English, you know, to thank us at the end of the semester. That was just like, oh my gosh, this is like awesome. You know, I've never been to China, but you know, it's like, man, I want to go visit these kids, right? So it's so, um, you know, the, the, the little things that we think we do is like, it's a lot for them, right? And they're getting this opportunity to be able to speak with folks who, um, who speak English, you know, every day. And so, so I think it was like wonderful practice for them. And I think they really, really appreciated that. And so um, I, you know, I, I've not done Velo, Susan, but I'm going to have to check that out. Jack, you want to say something? If not, that's okay. Uh, I didn't really have an answer for that question. That's different than the other two, honestly. It's the same. I leave that. Okay. Well, um, and with that, and this is why we wanted to share this panel with you all, because we have passionate um, and amazing educators who, um, you know, still want to sharpen their uh, teaching skills because of the online teaching requirement. And this is the mission of VIP Teach. Um, it's really to further our educators and equip them with the right skills um, so they can be better educators. Um, and, you know, it, all of them, our fellows, actually uh, give back to their community as demonstrated by their capstone projects, as well as their teaching to rural students in China, um, not only for their own satisfaction, but, you know, giving back to community and, and promoting international educational cultural learning. Um, so thank you. Thank you again, uh, Margaret and Asia Society for giving us the opportunity to share. Um, we you know, really look forward to sharing and learning about each other's experiences. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you to all of you at VIP Teach, to Wenchi, to Susan, Loretta, and Jackie. We're getting some really nice comments about how they're inspired, um, of how you are inspired, inspiring students uh, through all of this. So thank you very much. And now we have a session on Chinosity, engaging with students on Chinese language and culture from our Asia Society Center for Global Education. Presenting today are Cleopatra Wise, Director for China Learning Initiatives, and Sarah Deng, Program Associate. After this, we'll have a half hour lunch break. But for now, let's go to Cleo. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, I'm, I had to unmute myself. So I'm going to just share my screen right now. So first of all, thank you all for attending our session. We're quite excited to be sharing um, what we're doing in terms of engaging uh, Chinese language learners and students all across the world on uh, Chinese language and culture. Um, as Margaret said, I'm Cleopatra and I'm joined by my colleague Sarah Dung, who does the day-to-day -day operations for Chinosity. So about Chinosity, uh, we are a media platform that delivers viral news and content on Chinese entertainment, language, culture, and trending East and West stories. So what that really means is that we are trying to talk about China and discuss China in a way that actually is interesting to the Gen Z and young millennial generation. For us, we really started Chinosity uh, with this idea that we haven't been doing the best of job in engaging uh, students on China in a way that actually is relatable to them. So if you think about the way students engage with, let's say South Korea, um, they're thinking about BTS and they're also thinking about Korean drama. Or when you think about Japan, you're thinking about anime and a lot of the technology that's happening uh, in Japan these days. However, when it comes to China, we really talk about two different narratives. The first really being China as this uh, rising economic power and political power. And the second being China as 
5,000 years of history. And while both of those narratives are extremely important to the general conversation, they really don't touch and spark the interest amongst young people um, in the ways that they live and interact. And so that is why we uh, started Chinosity about two years ago um, and why we continue to do what we do um, and create those, bridge, those bridges between China and the rest of the world in a way that resonates with young people. So we really engage in three core ways. Obviously, we have our website and we are producing actual content. So we have both articles and video content, both long form and short form, form videos on our website and our social media channels. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will share um, our social media handles. So definitely follow us. Um, we also have an annual contest called Why Speak Chinese. Um, that we do every single year on social media. And then we have branded events. Um, we'll just talk about one today, which is our China Career Summit. So in terms of multimedia content, uh, we're really focusing on four core areas. One being life in China, and this is really focusing on uh, youth culture and the life of young people. So instead of talking about Kung Fu, we're talking about Chinese internet memes, uh, Chinese internet slang, pop culture, who are the hottest celebrities? What are people doing um, on you know, WeChat and on social media? How are young people engaging? How are they living their daily lives um, in China? The second being Chinese language, but really focusing on those interesting parts of the Chinese language um, that are relatable. So Chinese internet slang tends to be one of our most popular articles whenever we come out with kind of the list of what's uh, ongoing and how people are actually using the language or some fun ways people are um, learning Chinese and improving their proficiency. Um, the third being expats in China um, and people of the Chinese diaspora being the last. Um, in terms of expats, we really want to break the narrative that only one type of person can learn Chinese and one type of person can go to China and work and study and live in China. Um, oftentimes, if you went to you know, YouTube and you just search uh, Chinese foreign, uh, foreigners speaking Chinese or ch person speaking Chinese, most of the results will be a white young man speaking Chinese. And so we want for people who look like me, for people who are Hispanic, for people who are um, other um, ethnicities of the Asian uh, community that who are, who are speaking Chinese um, and living in China and really uh, display all of the groups of people that are living in China today. Um, and then in terms of China, um, the Chinese diaspora really focusing on both AAPI issues that we're currently facing in the US, but also other groups of the Chinese diaspora that you don't hear too much about. We had an article recently, well, a couple months ago on um, the Chinese community in Mexico. And we had a video that we did about um, the China, Chinatown in Panama and their annual Dragon Boat Festival. Most of our users and readers are between 18 and 34 years old. That's about 67%. And we have a strong global um, reach in terms of our readership representing 124 countries. So we're really trying to engage globally and all of our writers also represent the types of readers that we're trying to reach. So this is just some of the examples of our multimedia con uh, content. We do a weekly uh, video podcast called China on the Internet, and it's basically what you think it would be about. So lots of trending things on uh, Chinese Internet culture, things that are happening in terms of pop culture in China. It's really fun and light. Um, we're going to start up the new series of the uh, weekly video podcast. Uh, sometime in September, um, but you can see all of our existing content on our YouTube and on our Instagram. I ch purposely chose this photo um, with Sarah, and she is interviewing a movie director um, named Stanley Tong, who's quite famous. And so we have a lot of different content um, in those types of areas in terms of entertainment. And it's a way to have an easy access point for students and young people that may not know anything about China, but just have general interest in pop culture anyway. And so we're really trying to reach 
that demographic of students as well and engage with them in a way that's actually accessible. Um, we have another series that we do, which is our Chinosity Shorts. So this is very short form, um, Instagrammable videos that are meant to highlight Chinese culture. So we normally work with other social media influencers to do different types of video content. Um, one of the ones that I really like the most because I'm a big foodie um, is our Lunar New Year cook-off. And I'll play a short video of that. But this just basically features two social media influencers. They both speak Chinese, but they're non-native um, Chinese speakers cooking uh, traditional Chinese dishes. And so we did that around the Lunar New Year. And then we also have a video series uh, called Black and Gold, which is our series um, responding really to what was happening with the George Floyd uh, protest and Black Lives Matter, um, which has now even transformed into uh, a bigger social justice um, platform around AAPI issues and anti-Asian uh, hate. And so um, the Black and Gold series is really a platform to discuss the intersection between Black culture and Asian culture, which oftentimes you don't hear those conversations being had both in terms of culture uh, and dynamics between those two communities, but also in terms of our you know, shared goal of uh, social justice. And so this is um, a uh, panel discussion that we had uh, featuring um, featuring Bohan Phoenix, who is an Asian American rapper, MC Timudon, which means I can't understand um, in Chinese, um, who is, you know, a social influencer and a rapper. Um, he also is a former Fulbright fellow um, in Uchechi, who is very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. And so this was a conversation basically talking about how Asian people are supporting Black Lives Matter and what are the things that we can do um, to, to both um, uh, progress our shared goals. Um, and so it was a great conversation and we have a couple of videos in that vein and we keep making content based on the social justice issues that are um, coming uh, in you know, the forefront of the news and things like that. So I'll just play a short uh, part of this video. Hopefully you guys don't get too hungry because I know on the West Coast, it's almost lunch. Hey guys, I'm Amy from the YouTube channel, Blondie in China. Hi, Mama. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you how to make one of the most famous and popular Chinese New Year dishes, which is of course, dumpling. Here you go, it's gonna make you rich. Today I'm going to be making egg and chive dumplings. 用中文简单的来说是韭菜、鸡蛋、饺子, pork and chive dumplings meet vegetarian. As it turns out, dumplings symbolize wealth. They look kind of similar to the ancient silver and gold ingots that was used to be money in ancient China. The more dumplings you eat during Chinese New Year, the richer you are going to be in the New Year. So Add, let's go. And yes, I am pro. Your dida, you need three of them. As well as sesame oil and soy sauce, as well as vinegar for the dipping sauce. You're gonna need chives and dumpling wrappers. You know that you can actually get it in Chinese stores. I actually love tasuan. I love garlic, so I took a lot of them. Ta -da! So the first step in this process is to scramble the egg. And then whisk those up using my trusty chopsticks. Scramble the eggs. First, heat some oil over medium-high heat. And when the eggs are light and fluffy, you're going to remove them from the heat and put them in a bowl. So I'll stop this here so you all don't get too hungry um, before lunch. But in any case, um, most of our content is really reflecting a kind of BuzzFeed uh, uh, type of style and really um, looking to have students engage and young people engage in a way that's actually interesting and somewhat educational, but not like in your face educational. So instead of saying, oh, you know, dumplings have so much thousands of years of history and it's important to Chinese culture, really using it in a way that's relatable um, to students and for them to really engage uh, with our content, even if they have no background or understanding about China or Chinese culture. Hey guys. Okay, 
Um, we also have our social media contest that we do every year. We've been running it for the past, I think three years, almost four years now. Um, and it's called Why Speak Chinese. And basically what the contest really does is ask uh, Chinese language learners who are non-native um, to share their videos of them speaking Chinese and why they learn Chinese on social media. And what this does is both have a chance for them to kind of flex their Chinese language skills. Like, oh, you know, I really do speak Chinese. I probably told all my friends that I'm taking Chinese, but they don't actually believe me, right? So it's a way for them to flex that. Um, but it's also a way for all of their circle and their peer group to really see um, that someone that looks like them, someone that they may know or someone that they know of, uh, can speak Chinese, so then they probably can speak Chinese too. And it's a really powerful um, promotion for Chinese language. Um, we have this contest open globally, um, and we use social media influencers that are in the Chinese language um, learning space to judge the contest entrance, um, which is very, very cool. And we do a lot of different promotions around uh, why I speak Chinese every single year. Um, in October of this year, we are launching the next contest. So we're super excited about that. And we encourage you to get all of your students involved. We've had some Chinese language teachers get their entire classroom to do it um, as a form of extra credit. But it's definitely a fun way to really engage with students. Last year, we received 220 video submissions from 31 countries around the globe with over 100,000 um, views on all of the videos. And for our social media um, ads, we actually got 15 million views. So it's a quite powerful. Um, and I'll just play one of the winners. We actually um, select five winners, each from uh, each global region. So one from uh, Africa region, one from Europe, one from North America, one from South America, and one from uh, Asia as well. And this is our Turkey winner. She's from Asia. So I'll play a bit of her video, which is very funny. 大家好我叫魏一 那一刻我印象深刻，我开始唱中文课。现在我想参加一场歌唱比赛，所以我的目标是要努力，这样我才能大动评委，并与他们交谈，想这样。我的声音那么美，谁也不可以控制我，因为我真的不会这么。哇，
uh, formal opportunities for students who are learning Chinese. Therefore, this year we are starting our second annual China Korea Summit virtually in October. Um, on in October, so right now we are gonna establish the Korea Summit virtually um, on Wednesday and Thursday, October sixth to October seventh. It will be a summit that um, that will engage students um, in interactive virtual event for university students uh, who are interested in China related careers. Um, this is a part of our commitment to engage with uh, America youth um, on China. So regarding the events right now, um, we are planning to offer panel talks and breakout sessions of mentors and um, representatives from Chinese conglomerates like Alibaba and think tank leaders um, to talk about their journey of how they engage their career and truly give out some insight of how what skills the students need to develop um, when they want to launch their career after college um, related to China. Um, and, and also at the event, we're going to offer internship and employment opportunities for students who have the skills of Chinese language and um, a better sophisticated understanding of Sino-US relationship. Um, so therefore, we're talking about this because we welcome all attendees and um, our educators um, right now who are joining us, um, listening to this right now, to connect with us um, on this event so that we can present more opportunities um, for the youth that um, who are interested in China uh, or Chinese language related issue. Um, so I guess it comes to the ne next slide is how to connect with us. And I saw on um, in Q and A that we talked a little bit of how um, you, the students can get involved more with Chinosity. So I highly recommend everybody use your camera right now to scan the QR code. Um, all the first-hand information about upcoming Chinosity events, including our Career Summit, our Why Speak Chinese um, events, and all the callings for our fans to participate in collaboration, will be included in our weekly newsletter called Chinasi Review. And we'll also include exclusive content on Chinese learning um, every week. So it's a great resources for students as well as for our educators who wanna get connected. Um, you can always email us at info at chinasi.com for any uh, partnership idea, collaboration and internship opportunities. Um, and our social media handle are also listed. Um, just to be clear, in, on Instagram, we are called Chinasti News. Um, so yeah, I'll also- so I think right now we should, we should uh, go to the questions. So um, let's answer them one by one. So there's a question in the chat. How do we get involved on teaching in China? So we actually don't have any opportunities about teaching in China. Um, uh, for us, but if you are a uh, university student, and you're interested in going to our career summit, we will have a portion of the summit that's specifically about education based opportunities and how to become an international teacher um, to teach English in uh, China. So I hope that answered your question. And if it didn't, um, you can kind of clarify your question in the chat. Uh, the next question is, since you have so many students in China, do you have outreach programs that connect students in China with students in the U.S. to enhance mutual understanding? If so, I would love to connect with you. Um, you can contact us with the email that uh, Sarah put on info at chinocity.com. Um, we do have students uh, who work um, as interns and freelance journalists both in, the, both in China and in the US. Um, and we're trying to do more about getting writers globally um, to contribute to uh, Chinosity as both content creators for videos um, and also as writers for our articles. One of the main things that we um, wanted to do when we launched Chinosity is to make sure that our writers are reflective of the types of readers that we want uh, to read our content. And so most of our writers, they're either, you know, living and working, studying in China, or there's current students who are interested in China right, uh, right now are learning Chinese, 
are there Chinese international students? Are they um, are just curious about China in some way? So we are making sure that we have a lot of diversity um, so people can approach China and Chinese culture from differing ways. Um, someone said, how can my students participate um, to write articles for the website or to do programs like our Lunar New Year cook-off? So we are very much open to doing collaborative content. So if your students are interested in writing for us or interested in doing video uh, collaborations with us, they can just send us an email. We do have an ongoing internship program just for Chinosity. Um, in terms of schools in general, so if your um, university or your K through 12 school does a lot of uh, Chinese cultural programming and is interested in highlighting some of that work um, on our platform, we're definitely open to that. All you need to do is send us an email and we can work with you and kind of see how you want to highlight that. Because for us, um, one of the key things is making sure we are highlighting a lot of the diversity. So for example, I'm originally from Florida. I'm from a very rural town. We do have um, some partner schools that we work with um, for our Center for Global Education that are also located in rural towns and they do great kind of community events and kind of highlighting something like that would be very interesting for our website. Um, what else do I see any other questions? I don't see any other questions. So if you all have questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, you can um, contact us and we will um, get back with you. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're definitely open to more stuff. And thank you, Tina. Um, she said in Q&A to learning Chinese needs to be more relevant to our youth. Yeah, like that's the mission of Chinasi. We're trying to connect with them, um, not through the learning net level, but through their day-to-day -day life. Um, so yeah, we're doing virtual events and doing language contests on social media so um, they can be more engaged um, outside of classrooms. Yes. And um, so I think that concludes everything because I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. So maybe Margaret, you can take us from here. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much, Cleo and Sarah. Really, really love those videos. Thank you for sharing those with us.